truths the Buddha taught about suffering and its cause on the way to the end of suffering, They're called noble truths. And the question is, what's noble about them? They're motivated by the desire to put an end to suffering, which on the one hand may seem pretty common. Everybody tries to suffer less. Whatever people do, skillful or unskillful, you, you ask them why they were doing it, and it would come down to the idea, well, they'll be happier, or there'll be more pleasure, or less suffering, less pain. So it's a common motivation all over the world. And so it's noble about the, the noble truths of the motivation that they're working on. One is that the Buddhist standards are higher. It really does want you to look carefully at what you're doing and what the actual results you're getting are, so that you can figure out how to do it more skillfully. But then secondly, his discovery that in putting it into suffering, you're also finding a happiness that's blameless, that doesn't harm anybody else, doesn't harm you. Something that gets you out of the, the feeding chain. That's what makes it noble, the fact that we're looking for our happiness is blameless. There's that story about King Vasanity. One and one with his queen. You ask her one day, Would you, is there anyone you love more than yourself? And of course he's hoping that she's going to say, Yes, Your Majesty, I love you more than I love myself. But she's no fool, Queen Malika. She says, no, there's nobody I love more than myself. And how about you? Is there anybody you love more than yourself? And the king has to admit, honestly, that no, there isn't. So that's the end of that scene. It didn't go where the king thought of it. So he leaves the palace and goes to see the Buddha. And the Buddha said, you know, she's right. You could search the whole world and there'd be nobody that you would love more than yourself. But you also have to reflect that everybody else loves themselves just as fiercely as you do. And so the conclusion he draws is not that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. The conclusion is that you should never harm anybody. This is the basis for compassion, the realization that if we're really looking for happiness, it can impose suffering on others. He doesn't say why, but two reasons come to mind. One is that if your happiness depends on other people's suffering, they're not going to stand for it. They're going to do what they can to destroy it. And two, there's that simple fact of sympathy. If you see someone else is suffering because of your happiness, it places a tinge of sorrow in your happiness. Now, some people are very good at denying that. That's what a psychopathic personality is. It's, it does, they don't care. And there's a little bit of psychopath in many of us, in the sense that we just say it doesn't matter that so-and-so is suffering because we're looking for happiness. And so part of the path, and part of what makes it so noble, is we're learning how to get path, <coughs> past any psychopathic tendencies we may have. You want to get really sensitive to areas in which you're causing yourself suffering and areas in which you're causing other people suffering. Now, suffering here doesn't mean that you're hurting their feelings. Some people will use their hurt feelings to run your life. And that's not what the Buddha's talking about. He's talking about ways in which people would actually harm you, killing you, stealing you, taking your things that you need in order to find happiness. But what they're doing is their business. You've got to decide you're in this for the real thing. And part of that means you've got to raise your standards. The Buddha's approach is pragmatic. And sometimes you hear people complaining about pragmatism that people will say, well, it's good enough for me, and that's going to be good enough. And that's it. You think that's the pragmatic approach to life. 
The Buddhist is different. You adopt his teachings because they work. That's the pragmatism. But his standards are really high. And we've got to work on raising our standards to his level. This is often the hardest part of the practice. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha said the practice often starts with having admirable friends, people who have high standards. They want to help you raise your standards. So your idea of what's good enough gets stretched in the right direction. So you begin to see areas that you thought you were skillful, that you thought you were good enough. Well, it's not quite so. The Buddha once said that one of the secrets to his awakening was he wouldn't let, let himself rest content with his skillful attainments. He always pursued the question, is there a better way to do this? Are there higher standards of skill? So this is where criticism is helpful. Someone you trust points out that there are areas in your life where you are still unskillful. And even times when there's somebody you don't really trust, you don't trust their motives for why they're pointing this out, but they actually do point out something that's unskillful in your behavior. You've got to learn how to admit that. As a good sport, you don't want to be demolished by the criticism. That doesn't help. But you've got to learn to look at yourself. Okay, in what way is what that person says true? Do I still have this flaw in my behavior, in my thoughts, my words, my deeds? What can I do to overcome that flaw? That determination is what keeps you on the path and actually turns the path into a noble one. I was visiting a Dharma center recently where the, some of the students were complaining that their teachers were constantly pulling the Buddha down to their level. They're talking about how you know those reports about the Buddha's awakening when he had all those knowledges. That doesn't sound really possible. Maybe it was just a case of lucid dreaming. He's going to try to tear the Buddha down to their level. And that really puts an end to the path right there. It closes the mind to the idea that maybe there are things in the human mind that are more than we could have anticipated. I know that encountering a John Fung, that was what was so radical about the experience. It's the sense that he did have some psychic knowledge that I had never thought possible before. It opened my mind to the idea that maybe there's more out there than I had conceived, instead of taking myself as the measure of all things. Maybe it'd be good if I tried his standards. I found that I had to stretch myself work harder, meditate longer. When emergencies of various kinds came, I had to learn how to drop whatever I thought was important and focus on the emergency. Sometimes it was his health, sometimes it was other problems in the monastery, fires in the monastery, sudden projects that needed to be done. And there's a willingness to say, okay, I can stretch myself here. I think I've told you many times about the time when John Fung said we're going to sit and meditate all night. It was very early on in my time with him. And we'd worked hard all that day, or at least I'd been working hard all that day. And I didn't think I'd be able to handle it. And so I told him as much. He looked at me and he said, was well, it going to kill you? I said, no. He said, then you can do it. And I did. Much against my will, but at least I gave it a try and found that it really worked. I didn't die. Then I benefited from the experience. I learned that I was capable of more than I thought. So this is an important part of the practice, is being willing to stretch yourself. That line from Hamlet, you know, there's more in the universe than is dreamt of in your philosophy. That really does apply to the Buddhist teachings. Human beings are capable of more than we would ordinarily think. There are more dimensions to the mind that, that we would normally think. And 
And so it's this willingness to allow yourself to be stretched. That's how you end up finding the things that you, as the Buddha said, to realize what you've never realized before, to attain what you've never attained before. Because otherwise you keep on attaining the same old level. And nothing new ever happens, nothing new ever gets discovered. So on the one hand, this means being willing to listen to criticism. On the other is being willing to open your mind to the fact that there may be standards higher than the standards you already have. And if you really want your path to be noble, you've got to stretch yourself. The result, of course, is that you benefit and the people around you benefit as well. This is a path whose fruits are not limited only to the person who tastes the noble fruits. It requires that you be generous, that you be virtuous, that you develop thoughts of goodwill and compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, where they're appropriate. And that spreads the goodness around.